This webcast is part of the Human Services 2016 Learning Series. My name is Laurel Weirstra, and I'm Program Specialist with the Alberta Brain Injury Initiative, and I'm here today to welcome you to the web series. What is ABII? I'd like to start out briefly by talking about the initiative. Alberta Brain Injury Initiative provides funding to community-based agencies that coordinate local services through the provision of support, coordination, community capacity, and prevention. Service coordinators connect with adults with acquired brain injury and their families to a range of local supports, for example, counseling, emotional support, day activity programs, volunteer activities, and housing opportunity assistance. They also help providers with day-to-day -day needs such as transportation and buying groceries. The learning series for 2016 includes webcasts like this one for Alberta Brain Injury Initiative, but also for others from departments which include Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee, and Employment First. Check your emails for updates and information on upcoming programming, or you can visit the learning series to explore past and future webcasts and sign up if you're interested. For today's presentation, we're excited to have Gail Elton Smith here from Alberta Health Services, and she's going to talk to you about stroke. Gail graduated from the University of Alberta with a BSc in physical therapy. She's worked as a physical therapist on the stroke brain injury team at the Grand Rose Rehabilitation Hospital for 19 years, 12 of which she served as stroke outpatient coordinator for the Stroke Assessment Clinic. In 2008, she left the Glen Rose to join the stroke program Edmonton Zone as a stroke coordinator where she currently works. And today, she's going to take some time to talk to you about stroke, what it is, and signs of prevention. So now, I'll hand it over to Gail Elton-Smith for her presentation. Thank you, Laurel, and good morning, everyone. Um, today what I'd like to do is just talk about uh, stroke and how we can strike it out. Um, stroke is a brain injury. It's one of the um, main actual brain injuries that does impact our communities. And so we're going to look at that in detail this morning. Um, just to, to go over what we're going to talk about, we're looking at what exactly is a stroke. What causes it? What, um, what can you do to prevent it? We're going to look at the warning signs of stroke, what, might be, um, what you might see if somebody is having a stroke. What can you do if you, somebody you love is having a stroke and what, what should you do to react to that? And then um, spend a lot of time actually looking at the causes of stroke and what you can do personally to prevent a stroke from happening. So first off, what exactly is a stroke? And a stroke is a sudden interruption of blood supply causing damage to a part of the brain. So it is a brain injury, um, but unlike a traumatic brain injury where somebody is hit in the head from an accident or a, a, car, a car accident or a um, hockey hit, um, it's actually a, a stroke. It happens when you have an interruption in the blood supply. And brain damage is due to the lack of oxygen that's coming to the brain tissue. The technical term for it is a cerebral vascular accident. And it's when it occurs when a, the blood vessel is either blocked, in which case it's called an ischemic stroke, or it, the blood vessel bursts and the blood then bleeds out into the brain tissue itself. And that's called a hemorrhagic stroke. Either of these types of stroke are an emergency, and we're going to deal with what you need to do um, in just a few slides. So an ischemic stroke is due to a blockage of the blood vessel in the brain, and this can be caused either by a blood clot or a plaque buildup. And so what happens when you have um, an ischemic stroke, it's the most common type of stroke. About 80% of strokes are caused by this. And gradually over time, you can end up with a blockage in the blood vessel due to um, plaque that builds up along inside the vessel wall. All those years of Yorkshire puddings and cheesies and everything just sort of builds up over time and starts to block the vessel so that blood can't flow through. Um, and 
uh, another cause of an ischemic stroke is a blood clot. And this happens when you have um, a blood clot occurring somewhere else in the body, oftentimes in the heart, and it can end up then breaking off and flowing up through the blood supply until it comes to a vessel that's too small for it to pass through. In that case, it ends up acting like a cork, plugging the vessel, and so that any of the brain tissue downstream, so to speak, from that blood vessel is going to die. It's not going to get the oxygen and the nutrients that it needs, and so it ends up dying off very, very rapidly. A hemorrhagic stroke is when you have bleeding in the brain, and that's due to a burst blood vessel. It's not as common as an ischemic stroke. Only about 20% of strokes are caused by this, but it tends to be a more severe type of stroke. Um, it tends to be more serious, and this is because there's not a lot of room in the skull. Your brain tissue takes up most of that space, and so when you end up having bleeding in the brain, it takes up that space and starts to push the, blood, the brain tissue against the skull and can damage the, the brain further. So it tends to be a very serious um, condition that needs to be uh, dealt with immediately. The other problem with the blood coming out of the blood vessels and entering into the blood tissue or brain tissue itself is that that's very, very irritating to the brain. Um, it can tend to cause seizures and uh, it, it tends to be a very a real irritant and is difficult for the brain to absorb. So if someone was having a stroke right now, would you know what to look for? Would you know what to do? And a lot of people, we tend to, I think because of the heart and stroke foundation, a lot of people think that a stroke is caused in the heart, um, that it's a condition in the heart, but it's not. It is a condition in the brain. And so the effects that you see from it are any of the um, problems that we have, anything that's controlled by the brain can be affected by a stroke. And it, we had a campaign a few years back that gave a lot of the signs and symptoms. It was very difficult to remember and ended up sort of being a bit more confusing. So what the Heart and Stroke Foundation did was they developed a FAST campaign. And that's to help emphasize, A, the key things to look for if, you're, if somebody is having a stroke, and also to emphasize that we need people to act quickly and immediately if they see somebody suffering from a stroke. So it makes it a little easier to remember so that each letter stands for some effect of the stroke. So FAST, um, the F stands for face. And sometimes what you will see with somebody who's having a stroke, one of the first signs you may see is that half of their face just starts to sag. And so you'll end up looking at them and it, they'll just, their face seems to be asymmetrical. Their one side just seems to be drooping um, as if it's been paralyzed. The arms is the next, A for arms. Can you ask the person if they can raise both their arms? And then oftentimes what you'll see with somebody who's suffering a stroke is instead of both arms going up over their head evenly, you'll see one arm going up and the other one's too weak. It ends up only being able to raise about halfway up and they aren't strong enough to lift it equally over their head. Speech is for the S. Is it slurred or jumbled? Um, sometimes what you'll see with somebody who's suffering from a stroke is that either they will not understand you, so they'll be looking at you like you're suddenly speaking a different language and not understanding you, or they won't be able to speak back. It'll sound like they have a mouthful of marbles, or they perhaps the words that they're making aren't making any sense to you. Um, and so their speech has been affected. They aren't able to communicate properly. If you see any of these signs, it's time to call 911 right away. And that's what really we want to emphasize, is that stroke is an emergency. Um, you don't have time to call your daughter who lives in Sherwood Park and have her drive for half an hour to come pick you up and take you to whatever hospital happens to be nearest. You need to dial 911. We're just gonna go quickly, just to a brief video at the moment so that you can see the signs and symptoms of stroke.
The sudden appearance of any of these symptoms can mean that you are having a stroke. Get immediate medical attention. Call 911 or your local emergency number. A message from the Heart and Stroke Foundation, supported by the Government of Ontario. Okay. So a transient, you may have heard the term transient ischemic attack, and this has sometimes been, um, to be honest, wrongly called a mini stroke. That's what you'll sometimes hear people refer to it as. It should be more um, correctly called a warning stroke. Um, and this is because it's the exact same signs and symptoms of a stroke, but they're transient, which means it's short, it's temporary. They may last um, only a few minutes, um, sometimes just a very, very brief period of time. For it to be a true transient ischemic attack, all of the symptoms must resolve within 24 hours. So within 24 hours, all the symptoms have gone away and there is no permanent brain damage. Um, it's exactly the same sort of causes of stroke as well. For some reason, the blood supply to the brain has been cut off. But fortunately, in this case, the blood flow ends up being restored. Either the blood clot breaks up, it gets removed or dissolved or quickly, or there's some sort of re um, the blood flow ends up being restored in time that there's no actual permanent brain damage. The signs and symptoms are exactly the same. And the problem with TIA is that you don't know at the time whether what you're having is going to be a TIA and will resolve immediately, or whether in fact it's, it is a full-blown stroke and you're going to have permanent brain damage. So the way you react to these signs and symptoms is exactly the same as you do for stroke. You need to call 911. If the, if the um, symptoms resolve by the time the ambulance gets here, then yippee for you, <laughs> and you can rejoice in that. Um, the ambulance will still uh, take a look at you. They'll determine that, yes, you've had a TIA, and at that point then they'll put in place the things that are necessary to make sure you don't go on to have a full-blown stroke. A TIA is a warning sign that something is wrong and that you may go on to have a full-blown stroke even within the next couple of days. So if you think of TIA as angina is to heart attack, um, whenever somebody's, if they're at a party and they suddenly clutch their chest and say they're having chest pain, then 20 people whip out their cell phones and are immediately calling for an ambulance. We want the same reaction to be for stroke. If you see somebody with the signs and symptoms of stroke, an ambulance needs to be called. And if they happen to resolve by the time that they get there, that's fine. We still want the ambulance there because what they can do then is refer that person on to the stroke prevention clinic and hopefully prevent them going on to having a full-blown stroke, um, which you're at much higher risk to have even in the next few days after a TIA. So do not ignore the symptoms. I can't tell you how many people we had coming into our clinic with a full-blown stroke with an arm that's now useless saying that they'd been having little TIAs for months before their full-blown stroke actually happened, which they just ignored because, well, after 10 minutes it'll come back. It just My arm just does that. Um, don't ignore the symptoms. It's a warning sign that there is a real problem and it needs to be treated immediately. It is still an emergency. So why are we asking you to call 911? Why can't you just go, well, okay, let's put a, book an appointment with my doctor for a few days and see what, see what happens. The reason is, is because that there is actually treatment for stroke. If you get in quickly and, um, and get into a hospital that has the capability to treat stroke, then there are treatments that can remove that blockage, restore the blood flow, and prevent permanent brain damage. The problem is, is that these treatments are time sensitive. You only have a four and a half hour window from the time that you suffer the, the symptoms of stroke, the signs of stroke first appear, to when we can treat with a clot busting drug called TPA. There's an awful lot that has to happen in the hospital before that drug can be provided. It's a very um, 
it's a dangerous drug to be used. It, you need to have, it's, it acts like a very, very powerful draino to clean out the, the clog and restore that blood flow. And it can't just be given to anybody. There's a lot of testing that needs to be done. Um, a CT scan needs to be done first to determine that the type of stroke you're having is in fact a blockage and not a bleed. You obviously do not want to give a clot busting drug to somebody who's already bleeding into the, into the brain. So a CT scan needs to be done, lots of blood tests need to be worked up. Stroke can be mimicked, a lot of things look like a stroke that aren't in fact, in fact an actual stroke and so all of those things need to be assessed before the TPA can be given. So time is of the essence. Um, right now anybody who's suffering from a stroke loses 1.9 million brain cells every minute that they wait. And so we're asking people to call 911, get to the hospital as soon as possible. In Edmonton, there are two hospitals that are able to provide this clot-busting drug, and that's the University of Alberta Hospital and the Grey Nuns. So again, we're asking people to call 911 because that ambulance has a protocol in place to take the person to the hospital that is to either of those two hospitals. They'll phone the stroke team ahead of time. They'll clear the CT out of the way so that we get you there as quickly as possible and to try to decrease the amount of brain damage that's occurring. So again, if you take nothing else away from this morning, remember what the signs and symptoms are of stroke and call 911. And we're just going to hold for a couple of questions. Yeah, we've, we've got one question that came in. Uh, and the question is, if somebody has had a stroke in the past and already has aphasia and weakness on one side, is there an alternative sign to look for that would indicate they're having a second stroke? Um, yes, they're, generally what you're looking for is if they have a sudden worsening of their condition. So um, it, it is true if they've had a stroke in the past, um, then it, you know, you can't, if they, if they have difficulty communicating in the first place, um, then what you're really looking for is it, did it suddenly get much worse? You know, could they manage to communicate with yes, no before and now all of a sudden they're not communicating at all? Um, is there any, are there any other signs? So generally with stroke you're looking for weakness on one side of the body, um, you're looking for that facial drooping, um, speech problems, visual problems, um, and generally with somebody who's had a stroke before, they should not be getting worse they should be continuing to improve hopefully over time at the very least they're plateauing and they stay the same so if suddenly you're talking to them and they have a marked decrease in their abilities that would be a sign that you'd want to call 911 okay so Stroke can be very devastating, um, but the good news is 80% of strokes can be prevented. And that's what we're going to spend a lot of time um, this morning to look at, is how can we prevent it and what can we, what can we do? Um, we really want to reduce your risk for having a stroke in the future because literally a stroke um, is called a stroke because it comes out of the blue. You wake up one morning, you have all your plans for the week, you have kids to get to hockey and, and you have work to do and all of a sudden you suffer a stroke. You can literally go from one minute having a, having a stroke, um, being perfectly capable to manage yourself, get up, do all things independently, to ending up in a nursing care or long-term care facility. So the de risk of stroke or the effects from stroke can really be devastating. Good news, 80% can be prevented. So what can you do personally to reduce your risk of having a stroke? Now there are some risk factors that we can't change. Um, things like our age, as we get older our risk of stroke goes, goes up. Um, our gender, we, um, men tend to have a higher risk for stroke. Um, women are protected a little bit by, their, by the estrogen, but after menopause we quickly catch up and we end up um, at the same risk level as, uh, as men. If you've had a prior stroke or a TIA, you are at a higher risk.
Um, certain ethnicities, um, African, South Asian descent, um, First Nations people tend to have a higher risk for blood pressure and diabetes and so therefore that puts them at a higher risk for stroke as well. Family history, if anybody close to you, your parents, siblings have a stroke before the age of 65, that puts you at a higher risk as well. And uh, after menopause, um, women tend to, to catch up. Those are the risk factors we can't change. So let's focus on the risk factors that we can do something about. When you're, when you're born, your um, blood vessels are these nice round open vessels. The blood flows easily through, they're nice and flexible. Blood just flows, it's simple and easy. And over time, um, this starts to, um, can start to narrow and become more difficult. And it's generally because of things that we, we have happen or um, sorry, medical conditions, lifestyle choices that we make, and over time they start to block up and narrow that space um, within the blood vessel, making it harder for blood to flow through, making your heart have to work harder to push that blood through, and putting you at a higher risk for, for stroke. If we manage these conditions, then we can decrease the effect that they have on the blood vessel and make the space more open um, for the blood to flow through. And if we don't have these conditions, great. We can, if we can do what we can now to prevent them in the future. And we were, lifestyle strategies that we have that help prevent these conditions are often the same strategies we need to use to prevent or to manage conditions that we already have. So whether you're trying to manage or prevent these conditions, lifestyle strategies like getting the recommended amount of physical activity, managing stress, healthy eating, quitting smoking, all the things your mother probably told you 10 years ago, limiting alcohol, they're the same for each of these conditions. So we're going to take a look at each of them independently. Um, the first one is high blood pressure and high cholesterol. If we could take the general population right now in Edmonton, get everybody to have their blood pressure monitored by their family doctor and put managed either by lifestyle choices or put on medication to keep their blood pressure at a normal level, by that one risk factor alone, we would decrease the risk of stroke by 42%. Just by having everybody get their their blood pressure checked and go on medication or monitor with risk, with um, healthy lifestyle choices, um, we would decrease the risk of stroke by 42% with that one risk factor alone. High cholesterol is also one that we can look at if we could get everybody to get their cholesterol levels checked every couple of years and to go on a medication or to change their lifestyle and their healthy eating patterns, we could decrease the risk of stroke by 25 to 30 percent just with these two lifestyle choices or um, medical conditions. And the difference that that makes overall to your overall health can be dramatic, both for heart attack and for stroke. So what is blood pressure? Or what is high blood pressure? Blood pressure is the amount of pressure that's needed, your heart needs to create to push blood through your blood vessels and get the blood to go up to the top of your head and the blood that's down in your feet to come back up to the heart. It's the amount, there's a certain amount that's necessary to fl create that blood flow through your system and provide all the oxygen and nutrients that your cells need. Normal blood pressure sits around 120 over 80. And that's the amount of pressure, the 120 is the high number, that's the amount of pressure that's in the vessel when the heart originally pumps and put, does the push of the blood through the vessel. 80 is when the, the heart relaxes and the blood vessel sort of goes back down. So if you think of that lub-dub, lub-dub of the heart as it pushes the blood flow through, that's your pressure above and below, the 120 over 80. Anything more than 140 over 90 is considered high. And that does great damage to the blood vessel itself. It creates sort of a shearing force that happens every time your heart pumps. And over time, that damages the lining of the blood vessel wall and makes it easier for um, cholesterol to stick to the inside and create that narrowing of the blood vessel that can lead to a stroke. If that happens inside the heart muscle, then it creates a heart attack. If it happens inside the vessels that supply the oxygen and nutrients to the brain, then it leads to a stroke. And that's the, that's the key 
um, problem with the blood pressure. Um, if you sort of imagine your arteries or hoses, then anything that affects that flow of um, blood through those arteries is going to create higher blood pressure. So a narrowing of the arteries, such as the picture where you have a thumb over the, the, um, the water spray through a hose, um, anything like that that narrows the arteries is going to make your heart have to work much harder to push that blood through and will create high blood pressure. Or by turning on the tap, creating a higher blood volume, that as well is going to create a higher blood pressure and, uh, and make it more difficult. So that's where things like eating a lot of um, high salt diet comes in. The salt attracts the water, it creates a higher um, volume of water and it makes your heart have to work harder to push that through the body. So high blood pressure, again, it's the number one risk factor for stroke. And you want to make sure that you get your blood pressure checked at least every two years with your family doctor. If you have a number of other medical conditions or another, a number of other risk factors, then you may want to get that checked on a yearly basis. Even it, um, just regularly as you're going about your day, there's blood pressure cuffs in a lot of the pharmacies. Um, a lot of Safeway has blood pressure cuffs. While you're sitting there waiting for your prescription, shove your arm in there and see what your blood pressure happens to be. If you notice that it's getting close to that 140 over 90 mark or over that, then make an appointment and go see your doctor to get that checked. Oops, sorry. High cholesterol is another risk factor, and that builds up on um, the walls of the blood vessels, making it more difficult for blood to flow through. Cholesterol in itself is a good thing. Our body needs a certain amount of cholesterol to um, make cell membranes, vitamin D, hormones. Um, the liver makes approximately 80% of your cholesterol, and the rest comes from food, typically saturated and trans fats. And that's the part we're going to talk about that you can actually um, monitor. There's two types of cholesterol um, in fat in the body. There's the low density lipoprotein or LDL cholesterol. It's often called the bad cholesterol because it's the kind that clumps and attaches to the artery walls and makes things more difficult. The high density lipoprotein or HDL is actually called the good, we call it the good cholesterol because it will actually help remove this low density cholesterol from inside the vessel walls and remove it out of your blood vessel system. And so it helps carry it away from the artery walls and can be a protective factor for you. So how does, why does high cholesterol increase that risk for stroke? If you have a high LDL or the bad cholesterol levels in your blood, then it's too much of it is flowing through your arteries. And as you end up with tears along the artery walls, it can stick to that and start to clump. And that will lead to a narrowing of the artery walls, which is a condition called atherosclerosis. Sorry. Um, it can make it more difficult again for that blood to flow through um, and create a stroke and, and create your higher risk for stroke. There's no way of knowing either with high cholesterol or high blood pressure just by looking at someone you cannot tell whether they have this, either of these conditions. The only way these can be tested is through high blood pressure, through um, being tested by your family doctor with a, a blood pressure cuff, and high cholesterol to receive a blood, um, they do it through a blood test, they measure the amounts of cholesterol in your blood, and then they know sort of where you're at. So again, see, have this monitored at least every two years with your family doctor. Diabetes also um, increases your risk for stroke. Men with diabetes have a two to three times higher risk for stroke, and women with diabetes actually have a five times. Um, a, their risk for stroke increases by five times if they have this condition. So you want to make sure that you're preventing, hopefully, or managing your diabetes well to lower that risk. Um, so what is diabetes? Diabetes is when there's too much glucose or sugar in your bloodstream. And it tends to be a sort of molecule that can damage that inside, that lining of, the, um, of your uh, vessel wall. So if you think of sort of um, the lining of your vessel wall is a bit like Teflon. It's designed to be um, for things not to stick to it. It's designed to decrease the amount of friction between the blood as it flows through. But over time, that can start to wear away 
Um, and things like uh, diabetes and the glucose and sugar almost acts like a scouring pad. It starts to break that lining down and can create a condition where it's very easy for, especially if you have high, glu high cholesterol at the same time, for those to stick to the vessel wall and, and start to create a problem. There's two types of diabetes. Type 1 is diabetes is in about 10% of the cases, and that's where the pancreas is not creating any insulin. And your pancreas is an organ that creates a hormone called insulin, which helps to remove the sugar and glucose out of your bloodstream and back and store it in your body away from your vessel walls so, and return it, give it to the cells so that it can be used for energy. When it's not working properly, in type 1 diabetes, the pancreas isn't producing insulin at all, and so it ends up, um, all of it, just sitting in your blood vessel walls. In type 2 diabetes, which is the more, um, there's more of a case, there's 90% of cases have type 2 diabetes, and that's where the pancreas just isn't producing enough insulin, or the body isn't reacting to the insulin well, and it's not, um, it's not using the insulin properly. So in either of those cases, you end up with too much glucose and sugar in your bloodstream, and that can damage the arteries that carry oxygen to the brain. Sleep apnea is a fairly new, actually, um, in the last few years has become more uh, of a risk factor, a known risk factor for stroke. And it, what it does is with people with unobstructed sleep apnea are up to two and a half times more likely to experience a stroke. And again, if we can end up working on uh, managing these conditions, each time we take away a risk factor, it decreases our risk for having a stroke. So in terms of um, sleep apnea, what it is, um, if you can see by the slide, this is a picture of somebody's face um, lying down on their back sleeping. And in the normal airway, as they breathe in and out while they sleep, air is just flowing in and out. Um, the blood's receiving all the oxygen it needs. Everything is going very well. With obstructive sleep apnea, what's happening is that there's a blockage in the airway. And so the person will actually stop breathing for periods of, of time until such time as the, the body goes, hey, we're starving here, wakes that person up, and they roll over and go back to sleep. It, you know, they breathe for a little bit, and then all of a sudden it blocks again. It keeps waking them up. And so it ends up, because of this lack of oxygen or this decrease in oxygen on regular intervals throughout the night to the brain, it can really increase your, um, your risk for stroke. Atrial fibrillation is a um, is sometimes referred to as AFib and people with atrial fibrillation are about three to five times more likely to have an ischemic stroke. It's estimated that up to 20 percent of all strokes are caused by atrial fibrillation. This one, um, the risk of atrial fib, AFib increases with age. So after about age 60, about one-third of all strokes are caused by this condition. So you really want to know, A, if you're having AFib, and B, if you are, to make sure you're managing that well. It is the most common type of heartbeat disorder. And when a person has AFib, the electrical signals of the heart can become too fast and disorganized. So instead of having a regular heartbeat, lub dub lub dub it ends up being a, this kind of a bit of a quiver and an, kind of an incoordinated mess for a minute or it re beats too rapidly and that impacts how well the blood can flow through the chambers of the heart and end up coming out the other side so sometimes you can end up with these pockets where the blood pools and sits for a little bit Anytime you get blood just sitting and being stagnant it increases the risk it starts to clot and so what will happen over time is you can end up with a clot starting to develop as you then get a regular heartbeat that pushes that blood back out of the heart and into the system, um, back into the blood vessels. Then you end up with that clot now traveling through the bloodstream until it eventually reaches a vessel that it can, can't fit through. It acts like a cork in a bottle and you have a, you have a stroke. Just like high blood pressure and high cholesterol, most people don't know they have this condition. It's not something that you can generally feel. They don't feel any different, um, and they need an ECG test to detect it. It's easily treated with medications. Um, medications can either change the rhythm back to normal, 
or it can control the heart rate. Sometimes with this, you'll have somebody with a very, very rapid heart rate, and um, that can be a sign that this needs to be looked at. Blood thinners can also be described or prescribed, sorry, to help avoid that formation of the blood clot um, and that it could lead to a stroke. So it just keeps the blood a little thinner so that we don't tend to get those blood clots developing. Obesity is also one of the risk factors for stroke. Um, and the, the problem, obesity is one of those risk factors that actually impacts almost all the others. If you are obese, then you are at automatically at a higher risk for getting um, diabetes, you're at a higher risk for high cholesterol, you're at a higher risk for sleep apnea. It actually affects all the other risk factors that then in, increases your risk for having a, a stroke. Research has shown that blood pressure, blood sugars, cholesterol, all of the things that obesity impacts are also significantly improved with even a modest um, weight loss of five to 10%. So for example, if you weigh about 200 pounds, a 5% weight loss is 10 pounds and that brings your weight down to 190. While that weight is, would still be considered obese, um, the, that just simply losing those 10 pounds can significantly decrease the risk factors of high blood pressure, cholesterol. It impacts all the others. And so all of those risk factors together then decrease, add up to a significant decrease in your risk for stroke. The main benefit of um, of going on some sort of a weight loss program is that it improves not merely that one risk factor, but again, it impacts all the others. And so you end up getting a real bang for your buck with those 10 pounds. So how does it work? Obesity just, because it impacts the other risks, your high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, it ends up increasing your risk for stroke. And so again, if you manage it, you manage more than just one risk factor. There's certain tools you can use to help um, determine how much of a problem it, it is. Um, your doctor may use what's called the body mass index. And what that does is it takes, um, it takes your height and your weight and then it um, sort of puts you on a bit of a scale to tell you at how much of a risk for stroke you're, you are for developing not just stroke but other health problems. Um, so it'll put you in either the underweight, normal weight, overweight, and then obese classes one, two, and three. And at that point then they can talk to you about any modifications you might need to make. A simple thing that you can do at home um, is just to measure your waist circumference. It's actually a very good sign of how well you're doing because studies have shown that weight that's carried around your middle um, is actually more dangerous than weight that's carried down around the thighs or the hips. Um, it actually tends to put you at a higher risk just by where you carry it. So if you can keep your waist circumference less than 102 centimeters or 40 inches if you're a male, less than 88 centimeters or 35 inches if you're a female, then actually you know you're doing, you're doing quite well in terms of managing that. So there's, there's some, a couple of things to look at in terms of preventing or managing any health conditions that can increase your stroke risk. And there's really sort of two main streams that we can do this with. Um, one of them is just through a healthy lifestyle. There's certain activities that we do or don't do that automatically also affect our, um, our health and put us at a higher risk for stroke. So some of those, we've talked about the medical conditions that can put us at risk for stroke. There's also lifestyle choices that we make every day that will put us either at a risk for stroke or will help to decrease the risk of going on to have a stroke. Medical management is also, um, is also one of the things we can do to help prevent or manage health conditions. And, uh, and so th with this one, it's looking more at um, taking, the, taking your um, doctor's advice, sorry, um, taking your medications and treatments as prescribed, going to see your doctor on a regular basis, getting those risk factors monitored so that you know if you're starting to develop high blood pressure, you're starting to develop diabetes. All of these conditions intend to increase or become more likely as we age. And so a lot of people, well, I've never had a problem with blood pressure. Well, yeah, you probably didn't when you were 20. You're now 60 and it's probably might be a time to go get that checked. 
So you want to make sure you're doing what you can do to help decrease that risk. Women have special considerations, unfortunately, that put us at um, certain times of our life at a higher risk for stroke. Uh, oral contraceptives um, tend to, uh, women who take birth control pills and who also smoke, have high blood pressure, have a history of migraine headaches, um, have a significantly higher stroke risk. So you would want to talk with your doctor um, about, about taking that medication if, if you have these other risk factors. Talk to them. Um, pregnancy and childbirth, um, there's an increased rate of high blood pressure in, uh, in the overall population. Combine this with an increased risk of clotting post after they have the baby. All of these signs can sometimes develop and cause a stroke after pregnancy or during childbirth. Um, menopause is just that loss. We lose that protective um, effect of estrogen. We also tend to start gaining weight after menopause. Um, sometimes that can lead us to not exercise as well because it's a little more difficult to do. Um, we end up with, again, add that to high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, and all of those things can start to increase our risk and we start to join the men in terms of our risk for stroke at that point. Any medications that your doctor puts you on, it's extremely important that you take it. Um, we have lots of times coming into the clinic, um, people who have been given high blood pressure medication, um, they either, they don't really like it, they don't like to take meds, they, you know, forget to, forget to take it, forget to fill it before they go on holiday, this sort of thing. Um, stopping or missing doses of medication that your doctor has put you on can actually cause a stroke to happen in as little as two days. This is especially true of things like blood thinners. If you have atrial fibrillation and you're on a blood thinner, it's extremely important that you continue to take it because as soon as you stop, then your, your blood can start to thicken up and at that point you could be at a risk for having a stroke. So if we look at those risk factors for, for stroke um, and you look at the things we can change compared to the things we can't change, most of the things we can change. And we've talked about the health conditions, how we can either prevent them or manage them. We're going to look at lifestyle choices. What are some of the things that we can do? To, what are the lifestyle choices we make that can reduce our risk for stroke? So, when we look at the um, lifestyle that we take, it encompasses a lot of areas. It encompasses how much we move, um, what we're, how active we're being, what sort of things we like to do. It involves what we eat, what's our nutrition like. Um, are we ending up, you know, going for the fast food because we're so busy um, and we're not planning our meals properly? Are we drinking too much because we're too stressed and we end up going out for a drink after, after work on a, or more than one on a regular basis? Um, are, how are we managing our stress? Uh, stress levels at work, at home, a lot of demands, especially when you sort of hit that, especially if you're in that sandwich generation where you're caring for parents as well as caring for children and you're working full time and all of those things can end up um, creating a problem where you're drinking a little too much, you're eating not well, you're not sleeping well, you're not getting out to exercise because you don't have the time and if you happen to cope with all of that by smoking, then you're smoking too much as well. So physical inactivity is actually one of, it's now called the new smoking. And that's because a sedentary lifestyle, sitting on the couch, the amount of sitting that we do as a population contributes to more deaths than smoking now. Um, it can significantly decrease the amount of um, years that you have left in your life. And we tend to, as a culture, we sit far too long. We are, we are sitting at work. Um, a lot of us uh, are not, or tend to be at desk jobs. We're sitting behind a computer for a good part of the day. We're driving into work. We park really close to work so that we don't have to walk as far. We then sit in front of a computer all day. We go home, perhaps take our kids to exercise activities. So they're running around, but we're sitting watching them do that. And then we go home and we're tired and we sit in front of the TV. So by the time you've sort of added up the, the amount of minutes that we're sitting and not getting up and moving around, it really impacts our health. 
the thing about um, activity is that it doesn't have to be training for a marathon. And I had a number of people um, coming into our clinic, you know, sort of going, well, I know I should be more active, but A, I don't have the time, or B, um, you know, I just don't have the money to join a gym. I know I'll never go to a gym. And what, you know, what else can I do? Well, there's a lot of things you can do, actually, to increase the amount of physical activity you get in the day. What you're aiming for is at least 20 to 30 minutes. And when you think about 24 hours, really can we book off 20 to 30 minutes to actually do help our bodies um, fight some of these risk factors and improve our health in the long term. This doesn't actually even need to be done all in one go. It, you need to try to get 20 to 30 minutes in a day. So if you happen to be really busy, start off simple and, sm and small. Start parking two blocks away from where you need to work. Start taking the stairs. Um, we actually, our office is actually on the uh, fourth floor and I park on the fifth floor of the parkade. So by the time I go in and out of my office several times a day, I'm doing a lot of, of stair climbing that I could be paying a gym to go do, but I'm actually doing just going to and from work during the, during the day. So take the stairs instead of taking the elevator go for a walk and you know you really don't need to buy expensive equipment that may sit, end up sitting in your basement and uh, and just becomes a towel rack or a, a you know hanging up clothes on it over time um, just put on a pair of shoes and go for a walk um, in Edmonton that is difficult sometimes at this time of year but there's a lot of mall walking programs that are available um, if you go, especially early in the morning before the store is open, you can end up doing, you know, West Edmonton Mall is huge. You can do quite a good um, length of walk right from one end to the other. And then by the time you're done, maybe a uh, second cup is open, you can have a cup of tea or something to, to celebrate. Go with a friend um, to make it a little bit more fun and to have that person who's making you accountable to, uh, to exercise. Anything before you start, any kind of activity, physical activity program, especially if you've been sedentary for a very long time, check with your family doctor before you start any kind of exercise um, program. And start small. If you haven't been doing anything for a long time, start with 10 minutes and go for just step out the door, walk around your block a little bit, and then try to aim to gradually increase that over time till you get up to the 30 minutes of risk physical activity most days of the week. Poor nutrition is also a risk factor. Um, our culture, we tend to eat way too much salt, way too much fat, and way too much. Um, all of these things impact all of the risk factors and conditions over time, and you end up with increasing your risk for, for stroke. Um, excess salt increases high blood, it's a risk for high blood pressure and that's really how the main effect on, uh, on you. Um, we really shouldn't be consuming anything more than a teaspoon of salt per day. And I know a lot of people will go, well, I don't add salt to my food, so I should be good. Unfortunately, most of the processed foods that we eat have a great amount of salt in them. Just out of curiosity, take a look at your um, your can of soup that you've that you've bought that you give to your kids or um, or your breakfast cereal it's amazing how much salt is in breakfast cereal is in bran flakes that you wouldn't you can't taste it you don't actually even know that it's there so you need to take a look I'm showing I've just moved it over so you could see the nutrition facts on the back of that tub of margarine and those are on the back of all your soup cans on your bread label you know your loaf of bread, your box of cereal, everything has a nutrition label on it. Pay attention to the serving size. Sometimes what will happen is you take a look at the soup. Um, I had bought um, uh, the soup that comes in its own bowl. You can just nuke it right away. And I had thought it said healthy choice on it. I thought it looked pretty good. And um, what I didn't realize until after I'd been eating it for six months is that in actual fact, the serving size was only half the bowl which I thought was dirty pool because it's a, it's a bowl. You're assuming the person is no, not going to eat only half of it. 
It's meant to be um, something that you take for, for work and just throw in the microwave. And at half the bowl, it actually, all the, all the um, nutrition facts looked pretty good. But if you doubled that, all of a sudden, you're at over the limit for, for salt and for fat. Unhealthy fats um, are also a, a concern. And again, you can take a look at what you're looking for on that nutrition facts. You want to eliminate trans fats as much as possible from your diet. And trans fats are unhealthy fats that are produced during that chemical process called hydrogenation. Um, it's often found in things like donuts, um, fried foods, um, the soft tub margarines that um, can be found in there, French fries, flavored coffee creamers, that sort of thing often have a high level of trans fats in there. We've been working very hard. Um, the government has also been working to try and uh, lobby that to get rid of trans fats in our diet because of how detrimental those um, are to our health. Um, we still have a ways to go there, um, so keep an eye and take a real look for trans fats and get rid of those out of your diet. You want to decrease the amount of saturated fat that you're eating, and saturated fat comes from animal origin. So things like butter, um, the anything that's solid at room temperature, you can have a pretty good idea that that's a saturated fat. So butter, for example, at room temperature it sits in a lump, it doesn't just melt all over your counter. Um, that is a saturated fat and you want to limit or decrease the amount of that that you're getting. You want to increase your fiber intake. F increasing fiber helps to lower your cholesterol and um, so you're targeting about 30 grams a day. So again use the nutrition facts on the back of your cereals and things that you're eating to try to increase the amount of fiber that you're getting on a regular basis. Reduce your excess calories. You want to follow Canada's food guide. And I think the main key for, for this that really tends to trip us up is the serving size. And over time, um, our sizes have been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm going to age myself a little bit here, but when I was a kid and you went to 7-Eleven and you grabbed a Slurpee, the, the cup size was this big. Um, you now see kids like with two hands to hold this thing as they're trooping down the, um, down the sidewalk. And they're drinking two liters of pop at a time. So anytime you know you increase the amount that you're eating, you're taking in excess calories and really affecting um, your weight over time. So if you follow Canada's food guide, it gives you some good examples of what a serving size looks like. So before you end up just piling that pasta onto your plate, next time take a look at what a serving size actually is and even measure it out a little bit. Um, some of the tricks you can do are even to just put it on on a smaller plate. Um, for some reason our eyes often trick us and uh, we end up thinking we have to fill that plate and plates have been getting bigger over time as well. Um, so you know if you take a smaller plate and fill that up you may be surprised and find that by the time you finish that you're actually good and you don't need to go for that second or third or fourth helping. Um, the DASH diet stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. It's for people who have or are at a risk for high blood pressure or who have high blood pressure. Um, and uh, there's a lot of information on, on the uh, internet or um, actually if you access HealthLink, um, they can provide you with any kind of information that you would like on, on that. As well as if you would like to speak with a registered dietitian, Alberta Health Services have a number of programs and information sessions that are available on diet and, and helping to improve that. So if you're interested in, in Looking at any of those, um, if you contact HealthLink, um, they can provide you with the information of where those classes are held and, and how you can access that. Too much alcohol can also be a, a risk. Um, it attends, it's a risk in itself because it affects your other risk factors. It affects blood pressure, sleep apnea, cholesterol, atrial fib, obesity, diabetes. And uh, too much of a good thing um, can be a problem for us. So what are the guidelines? Um, anybody who's at a stroke risk needs to have a maximum, a daily maximum of a drink a day for women. Um, men, unfortunately, get to uh, have a little more so they end, can end up with uh, two drinks a, a day, but that's a general maximum. So a standard drink means one bottle of regular strength beer, um, one five ounce glass of wine 
and or one and a half ounces of spirits. So with anything with 40% alcohol. If you find you're having a little trouble cutting back on alcohol management, just plan to start slowly decreasing the amount of alcohol that you're taking. Start with trying to have one or two day alcohol free days a week. And if you're really struggling with that, then make sure you're contacting HealthLink and asking for, um, there are a number of agencies that can help um, manage this risk factor. And uh, there's a lot of places that are available to help you with that. Stress also affects blood pressure, cholesterol, hardening of the arteries. So you can see how our lifestyle really impacts all of the risk factors that we have for, for stroke. And our, again, our culture tends to be high stress. We're very, very busy people. Um, we tend to not be able to say no. And so we take on more things than we, than we should. Um, and we're, we tend to, when we get stressed, we often fall back to unhealthy coping mechanisms. So people who are really stressed, sometimes they feel, well, I'll just have a cigarette and that will calm me down. I'll go for a drink and or I'll have a couple of drinks and that'll help. Um, I, you know, I'll stop. I'm really, you know what, I've had a really tough day. I deserve that hamburger and french fries and um, uh, you know, milkshake. And so we tend to, when we are get stressed, we tend to fall back to really unhealthy ways to cope with that. And we, we forget to take our medications, we don't exercise because who wants to do that when they're tired already? Um, and all of these things then impact our risk for stroke. So if you're having, if you find you're tense all the time, you're having sleep problems, you're really irritable and, and anxious, um, you're overeating or you're undereating, some people overeat when they're stressed, some people just don't feel like eating because they're, they're too stressed. Um, if you have poor memory, those sorts of things, those can all be indicators that you are too stressed in your life. And you need to recognize your personal signs of, of stress and what level you're at and then start to put systems in place to manage that stress before it affects your health. Everybody has stressful periods in their life. Um, I know for myself, getting my kids out the door in the morning, sometimes I'm driving to work with gritted teeth and <laughs> clenched, clenched hands. Um, those, are, those tend to come and go. By the time I get to work, I've sort of relaxed and I'm, I'm okay. But if you're finding that you're stressed all the time, you're just tightly wound, you're anxious, you're biting people's heads off because you're so stressed out, um, then that's a sign that something needs to change. And you need to really step back, take a minute, find out what are the causes of the stress that you have and what things can you do to, to manage that. Um, is there some things you need to step back from and say no to just so that you can um, have a little more time for yourself and to, uh, to manage your health? Learn to say no to things that are not a high priority. Ask for help um, when you need it. And there are community resources, um, counseling, uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of yoga, um, mental health areas that can look at helping you with managing this risk factor. Um, smoking and secondhand smoke um, really increases your risk for stroke. Smokers are about four times more likely to have a stroke than non-smokers. The only good thing about smoking is that actually your blood vessels are very forgiving if you quit. So within quitting, um, your stroke risk will return to normal within about five years of complete stoppage of stroke. That doesn't mean, or sorry, stoppage of smoking. That doesn't mean, you know, you go from two packs to one pack. Um, you need to quit completely um, and uh, decrease and then quit completely. So it, your risk returns to normal within five years of actually completely quitting smoking. Your heart attack risk decreases within 48 hours of quitting and cuts in half within the first year. And your, um, the, your HDL levels rise to non-smoker level within a few weeks. So you can see real, your body will make real changes um, within even within the first few days and weeks of actually quitting. Again, there's a lot of options that are available. Um, Alberta, um, the AHS has created a program called Alberta Quits um, that offer free um, counseling, free programs, helpline, online programs, group counseling sessions um, to help you with 
quitting smoking and qu decreasing this risk factor. So you can talk to your doctor about options that are available. Um, take a smoking cessation class, call HealthLink and get the information about Alberta Quits. So really what I'd like to challenge you to do at this point is to take a look at what risk factors do you have. Think for a minute about what we've just been talking about this morning. What are the risk factors? And if you have a moment, grab a pen and a piece of paper. Take a, write down the risk factors that you have that you can't change. How many of them do you have? Um, because that already sets a baseline for how, how urgently you may need to deal with the risk factors that you can manage. Um, if you end up, if you're from a family, um, you're of um, uh, South Asian descent and your parents and brothers and sisters have all had stroke before at 65, then you may need to take this a lot more seriously or you need to take this a lot more seriously and take a look then to manage the risk factors that you can change. Of those risk factors, what are health conditions that you have right now or that you need, want to make sure you prevent? What are lifestyle choices that you're making that you can then change and adapt to, um, to impact your health? If you're considering a change, are there any risk factors you need more information about? Um, say, for example, that your doctor has told you you have high blood pressure. What are some of those lifestyle management? You want to learn a little bit more. What can I personally do about what I eat, um, what I, the choices that I'm making, exercise, etc.? What can I do to help decrease that risk? If your doctor's told you you're at high, um, you have high uh, cholesterol levels, what are some dietary choices? What do I need more information about to make that change myself? Um, if you were to make changes, what would you work on? What's the first thing? And start, start small. Pick one risk factor that you think is something that, that you're struggling with or that could be a risk for you and start to work on that one. There's a lot of great places to go for information about um, these lifestyle choices that you can make to impact your health. Um, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, for example, has all of their brochures online. So if you access their website, um, just look for Heart and Stroke Foundation Canada. They have a whole health information link and section, and you can pull that up. They have a lot of information on, um, on uh, heart, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. They give you um, recipe tips and, and healthy living. They'll even send it to your um, email, a, a new recipe with a, a good um, a good recipe and a healthy recipe um, every every couple of days. So there's a lot of things in place. Alberta Health Services has a lot of the chronic disease management have put a lot of programs together where if you are kind of more the person that needs to hear from an expert, um, they have drop-in programs where you can come and sit and learn, sit with a dietitian, learn what it is that you need um, to, to do to change some of the behaviors that you have also take a look at suppose you don't make any changes what would be the downside take a look at your health right now um, what might your life be like in five years if you continue to go the way you're going what might that be like what things will that impact how will that impact your family um, how will that in fact impact your friends how might it impact some of the activities that you like to do if you just continue on the road that you're going you're going down if you decide to make a change, what do you hope will be different in five years? Set a goal for yourself. It really helps if you kind of take um, one of those risk factors, set a goal for the future, and then aim towards that, w really work towards that. What will be the best results? What do you hope to, to gain? And then make that decision. Yeah, and only you can, can make it. Is this risk factor important enough for you to keep working on it? Are you confident that you could take those small manageable steps um, to work forward? And bring people 
um, bring people alongside with you. It helps to have a partner in this. Um, it helps to have a friend that you can go walking with, somebody that you're, um, you can talk about the struggles with together. Um, if you concentrate on one thing at, at a time, take small manageable steps, bring your family on board to help you with it so that it's more of a social event. All of these things can help make this a success and a change for, for you. These changes and these um, changes that you make in your lifestyle and in your healthy living, they have to be important to you. If they aren't important to you, you're never going to do them. So write down three to four ideas of what you could do and be creative. If you, if you end up, well, I'm going to buy a treadmill and I'm going to walk on it. If you hate walking on a treadmill, then I can guarantee you're going to be hanging your laundry on it in a week and you'll have just spent an awful lot of money. So what, what if you like cross-country skiing? then maybe find a small group that you could cross-country ski with. Maybe you enjoy um, ice skating. Uh, Edmonton now has that um, River Valley uh, skating. Um, they've you know, changed the sidewalk. You can actually skate through the River Valley for a kilometer. Find something you enjoy doing and grab a partner and just go do it. Get ideas from other people, but make it fun and you'll be more likely to continue to do it. You need to pick a time um, and pick a time that's a good time to get started. If you know that, you know, if you know that next week you're going on holiday and you're going, you know, you're not going to be able to, to get going and start with what you're doing, um, then pick another date and, and find a date that works for you and keep going. Report your action plan to a family member or fr a friend. And you know what? If you fall off the wagon and you end up eating a Big Mac and large fries and a, and a Slurpee or something for lunch, just don't pick yourself up again and keep going. Don't throw up your hands in the air and decide you're, you can't change. You can always pick yourself up and start again. And make sure you discuss your risk factors and your plans with your health care pro providers. Talk to your family doctor and f access the resources that are available. So I just sort of really want to end at this point with remembering those three R's of stroke, to recognize the signs and symptoms. And do you remember what they are? We talked about them over an hour ago. So it, um, it, it remember the fast. Okay, face. Is your face drooping? Is it suddenly sagging? Um, if so, then you need to act quickly. Arms. Are both arms equal and going up over their head or is one weaker than the other? Um, speech. Are they garbled? Are they having trouble speaking? Do they look like they're not understanding you? And if so, any of those signs, call 911. Do not bundle them into your car and drive them. Call 911, get that ambulance there immediately. Remember, for every minute you wait, you're losing 1.9 million brain cells. So you want to act fast and act immediately because time literally is brain. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gail, for a very informative presentation this morning. I think we've all learned a lot. Um, as Gail said at the beginning of her webcast, that 80% uh, of stroke is preventable. So if we remember the acronym FAST, we can all do our part to keep all of those people we care about healthy. The other thing I want to mention in closing is to thank you very much for your attendance this morning and to um, visit this webcast again or any other, other webcast series we have. Visit hslearningseries.ca for upcoming information. And again, thank you for participating. If you could take a moment to fill out our survey at the end, we certainly appreciate your feedback and your time this morning.